Welcome back uh, to part three of this interview series where I'm speaking with Dr. James Andrade on neuroscience in learning, motivation and leadership. And part three right now is going to be on leadership. James, thanks again for being here with me today. All right. So James, when it comes to leadership, all right, um, how can neuroscience help leaders better manage their team and just be a, a better leader overall? First off, uh, we need to understand that there is no one type of leader. Actually, there are different types of leaders, different types of situations. We talk about situational leadership. Mm -hmm. And depending on the situation, you might have one behavior and in another situation have a very different type of behavior. Neuroscience actually helps us understand the different types of leader that you want to be depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the prefrontal cortex of the brain is very good at logic, very good at uh, processing information, uh, very good at making decisions. Mm. And many leaders think that that is the sole part of leadership. But there's an emotional component to mm. it. Uh, there's a uh, empathetic component of mm. leadership. So if you look at the uh, limbic system, um, the amygdala, which moderates emotions and understands emotions. That's an important part of the brain that also informs us of leadership skills that leaders need to have. Hmm. And then finally, no matter what you tell people, what they do is see what you do. Hmm. So it's not what you say, it's what they see. And that's where mirror neurons actually come into play. Mirror neurons are something that we are wired to connect. Hmm. Um, I look at you and I see your behaviors, you look at me and see my behaviors, we begin to sync. We understand each other on a very nonverbal level. Mm. So we see what each other are doing, whether it's aggressive, non-aggressive, friendly. So taking those three components together, it helps inform us from a neuroscience standpoint, mm. how leaders can behave. Okay, that's very interesting. You mentioned um, a little bit about empathy just now, and I I'd like to touch on that a little bit more, right? Like, Empathy, how does that really fit in towards being a better leader? Because I think a lot of times you don't hear empathy and leadership going hand in hand. That's because very often empathy is mistaken as uh, not holding people accountable or uh, not, uh, not uh, having uh, potentially being tough on people. Mm. Um, and that's, that's not it at all. Empathy is actually listening and understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's an important part of leadership, particularly if you're trying to build a high-performing team. Mm -hmm. If you want your, uh, your team to respond, part of what you need to do is to, is to listen. Uh, ideally, we hire people that are extremely bright, very good, and capable at what they do. Uh, we should be listening to them. Mm -hmm. We should be unleashing them to... Uh, to do the best job that they can. Hmm. Uh, part of being a good leader is sometimes taking a step back and allowing your team to move forward. So is empathy then a subset of emotional intelligence? It is, I mean, emotional intelligence is having a good sense of yourself hmm. and who you are, but it's also having a good sense of the people that are around you. Hmm. In this case, your team. Hmm. Uh, leaders that have high emotional intelligence generally get the best out of their teams. Hmm. Leaders that have lower emotional intelligence may be more autocratic, hmm. much more top-down, much more con command and control. Uh, they don't get as much out of their teams. Their hmm. teams tend to take a step back and wait for them to make decisions or for them to lead. Hmm. Interesting. Um, in, the, in, in the world of leadership, I mean, it's, it's often been said and known that trust is a big factor, right? So what can neuroscience tell us about trust and leadership? Well, if you don't trust, if there's fear, um, then what you'll get is fight or flight response, particularly mm -hmm. from the people that are a part of, of the subordinate side of the leadership. Yeah. Um, if you get fight, then you'll get someone who's constantly in, in conflict with the leader. Flight or fright, uh, you'll get someone who is just apprehensive yeah. uh, and maybe doesn't even show up at the meetings. Mm. And then you get the third behavior, which is freezing. And that's where you actually get no response from the individual at all. So what, what makes some leaders inspire trust better compared to others? 
really comes down to some pretty simple things. One is listening. Um, listen to your team. Uh, give them an opportunity to give you feedback. Mm. The other is being open. Being transparent yourself as a leader. It's okay to say that you don't know, mm. particularly if you are bringing in people that are extremely good at what they do. Um, and then the last is, and this is hard for many leaders, is, is being vulnerable. Mm. Um, you know, it's okay as a leader, not only to not know, but also maybe not to have a good day or to rely on someone else in your team. Situational leadership is something that's critically important. Uh, depending on the situation, the leader may cede leadership to someone else on the team who actually has more skills and more capable. Mm. It doesn't make them less of a leader. It actually builds trust within the team that their voices will be heard. Yeah, because I think trust, like you said, it is a big component and knowing how to build that trust, right, is equally as important. Like knowing trust is important, but not knowing how to do it. Is, Absolutely. Is, yeah. So James, um, there's no one type of leader, right? Because you talked a little bit about different leadership styles just now. What are the common leadership styles that we can see in, in common organizations? Mm. So there are leaders that are very democratic. Um, they get everyone's, uh, everyone's uh, opinion. Uh, some of those leaders will take everyone's opinion and then make a decision. Others will be democratic to the point of we'll go with whatever the majority says. Um, there are other leaders that are much more uh, directive. Um, you hear of leaders that are ask-oriented, where they're asking for input, and others that are much more tell-oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those leaders are described as very top-down or very autocratic. The reality is that you need a variety of different types of behaviors and agility to move from one leadership style mm -hmm. to the other, depending on the situation. So once again, if you have a very complex problem, and assuming that you've brought in a team that is extremely capable at what they do, you want to get as many inputs as possible. Mm. But if you're in a situation that requires an immediate decision, and maybe it's something that's uh, extremely uh, critical, uh, you may need to make a very fast uh, directive type of, mm. of response. The key is agility. Mm. The key is flexibility. Do you have the leadership agility to seamlessly move from one type of decision-making process to mm. another. So how do leaders then create this agility? Well, one is learning different leadership styles. Mm. Um, all of us come in with a predisposition towards one leadership style versus another. Uh, leadership can be taught. Uh, while it's uh, sometimes asked, are leaders uh, born or are they made? The reality is, there's a little bit of both. Mm. Some leaders or some people come in with a predisposition towards leadership. Maybe they're uh, extremely uh, uh, effective at uh, making decisions, um, very decisive individuals. Other people may be uh, extremely uh, eloquent uh, in their speech. Um, being able to convey your ideas clearly mm. is something that uh, leaders need to be able to do. Communication skills are critical. Mm. But just because you don't have those skills naturally, it doesn't mean that it can't be taught. And it doesn't mean that your style, if you're someone who's a little bit more reserved or a little bit more introverted, doesn't mean that good leadership is all about being an extrovert mm. or being uh, uh, overly uh, uh, upfront and effusive. Um, you can be true to yourself and still have the flexibility of different leadership styles and it can be learned. Mm, interesting. So James, um, this is part three of our interview. In part one, we talked about learning. Part two, we talked about motivation. So if we were to tie learning and motivation together into leadership, how can leaders harness all of this to become a better leader? So one of the things that, uh, that leaders can do is work at building high-performing teams. Um, building high-performing teams are, number one, selecting people that are very good at what they do. Uh, number two, creating a learning environment. Um, so allowing people to fail. Um, if you want people to take risks, you have to allow them to fail. Mm. 
and use that failure when they have it to teach uh, how to improve or how to make corrections. And when you do those things, then you find people that are motivated. So you can actually draw the line from learning to leadership to motivation. And the key is, is the leadership part of it. James, thank you so much for joining me here today and for joining everyone with, with such valuable insights that you have shared on learning, on motivation, and on leadership itself. Uh, if you're just joining us for this part, do go and check out part one and part two. Believe me, there's a lot of valuable insights there. Um, if you're new to the channel, if you're new to this podcast, please do subscribe uh, because it really helps us do what we do best. All right. So, uh, James, thank you once again for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me.